welcome to the lecture on heat treatment of castings. In this lecture, we will discuss about heat treatment of cast iron and non-ferrous metals and alloys. So, we have discussed about the different kinds of cast iron and when we cast the varieties of cast iron, we need to go for the different kinds of heat treatment so that we can get the desirable properties. So, coming to the variety of cast iron that is grey cast iron. The grey cast iron if you want to have improved machinability or improved wear resistance or improved strength or the stress removal because once we do the casting we know that we will have the chance to go for certain heat treatment because there will be stresses inside it because of the thermal gradients which is there during the cooling process. Also although grey cast iron has good machinability because of the presence of graphite flakes, uh, we still may think of having the grey cast iron having better machinability. In many cases we feel to have the improved wear resistance like when the grey cast iron is used for the rings of the piston. In that case you need to have these or cylinder liners in those cases you need to have the wear resistance to a higher degree so that its life is longer. Similarly, for improving the strength of the grey cast iron which has been obtained after casting we need to do certain type of heat treatment so that its strength is increased also the dimensional stability and stress removal. So, for these reasons you have different kinds of heat treatment which is required on the cast product. Now, improvement in the machinability of grey cast iron. So, we know that for improving the machinability normally we go for the annealing process. So, in that case the subcritical annealing may be done which promotes spheroidization of perlite and some degree of graphitization. So, in this case the lower critical temperature below that so may be about 600 to 700 degree C of heating and holding at that temperature that is subcritical annealing. So, if we do that basically holding for larger amount of time that leads to the formation of spheroids of this perlite. So, that is known as spheroidization of perlite. So, and that basically improves this uh, machinability and also you have some degree of graphitization. So, some graphites are also formed at the expense of the carbide or the carbon. So, the subcritical annealing is one of the methods by which the structure is spheroidized. So, there will be a spheroidization of this perlite and the improvement in machinability of the grey cast iron. Then we can also do the complete annealing. So, if we do the complete annealing for that we are going above the critical temperature. So, we are going about around 900 degree centigrade or 9 to 950 degree centigrade and then we are basically cooling in the furnace at a very slow rate. In that case there will be, so we are going into the austenitic range and then we are very slowly cooling. So, certainly when we talk about grey cast iron in presence of the graphitizers like silicon. So, under that slow cooling all the complete graphitization will take place and that will make the iron very soft and in that case it will result into a softened structure as well as it will improve the machinability of the structure. Permanent mold castings are fully annealed. So, that is normally the requirement because in the permanent mold castings the heat transfer rate is normally higher than in that in the case of sand molds. So, here you need to go for full annealing so that there is complete graphitization taking place and the grey cast iron becomes softer. 
if we do the normalizing, so when we are going doing the annealing, full annealing, we are going to that temperature about 900 degrees centigrade and then we are cooling at a very slow rate in the furnace. But if we cool in the air, then that is slightly a faster cooling rate than in that case of annealing. In those cases, some perlite is retained. So, retention of perlite gives the higher strength because of the fast cooling rate the complete graphitization does not take place and because of that perlite is retained and that gives more strength and hardness as compared to that in the case of annealing. So, these are the methods. So, in this case you will have improved machinability as well as you will have the improvement in strength as well as in hardness and in these cases it will become completely soft and it will have a very high degree of machinability. Now, in the improvement in wear strength and wear resistance as well as strength. So, we have the treatment like hardening and tempering. So, we know that when we go for hardening in those cases the strength is increased, hardness is increased. So, for that we are going to about 910 to 925 degrees centigrade and then we are quenching into oil or water to produce a martensitic structure. So, that is a simple principle of hardening in which we are going into the austenitic range and then we are uh, quenching drastically into oil that is favored, but we can also go for water or brine solution and that re results into fully martensitic structure that increases the hardness. Now, in those cases because hardness is quite large and the martensite formed is very extremely brittle. So, basically you do some softening and that is why you go, go for tempering. So, tempering will be done at various temperatures. So, suppose in the case of cylinder liners you see that you first make it hard and then further you temper it at the temperature of 200 to, to 10 degree centigrade for some time. So, that way you are basically giving some softness in the phases that is completely brittle phase that is basically tempered. So, that martensite phase is tempered. You also do you can also go for flame or induction hardening. So, the so these flame or induction hardening they are the surface hardening methods in that the core is remaining soft, but only on the surface you induce the hardness. So, that improves your wear resistance. So, wear resistance is improved uh, at the surface and for that you have flame or induction hardening which is a variety of surface hardening that is carried out. For improving strength hardening followed by tempering at this produces at. So, if your tempering temperature is higher basically that improves the tensile strength. So, at lower temperature if you are doing the tempering that basically makes the phases soft that basically. So, you have the extremely brittle phase formed its brittleness is minimized. So, for that you take the lower temperature, but if you go for little higher temperature then that produces the optimum tensile properties. Stress relief. So, the name indicates that you this is the process for relieving the stresses which are generated during the casting process or during the machining or during its use. So, during that many a times it also changes its dimensions so, because of the stresses which are generated and if that stress is basically more than the strength of the material then material may change its shape there may be deformation taking place. So, for that annealing or normalizing may be carried out to alleviate the stress. So, for that we are heating slowly to 480 to 590 degree centigrade holding for an hour or more and then cooling slowly to 200 to 300 degree centigrade. So, this way also you try to alleviate the stress. So, either you go for normalizing or annealing or you may go in this range heating and then further cooling. So, that basically relieves the stresses. 
coming to the another variety of cast iron that we have already discussed. So, the variety of cast iron is white cast iron which is converted to malleable cast iron by the annealing process and we know that since white cast iron is of no use for the engineering purpose other than wherever we need the extremely high degree of hardness. So, in otherwise to get the malleability we are annealing this white cast iron for long hours. So, that the carbon which is in combined form it is converted to the free carbon or temper carbon. So, this annealing heat treatment for white cast iron is done in three steps. So, as we know we are heating to a temperature about 900 degree centigrade right 50 and then we are holding there for a very large amount of time. So, during that holding, so first of all when we are heating to a very high holding temperature, so during the early periods there will be nucleation of graphite taking place. So, basically this annealing is occurring in three steps or three stages. First stage is nucleation of graphite means the graphite will nucleate during the holding period early holding period. So, when we are heating and going to the holding temperature during the early period or during that period this nucleation of graphite takes place. Now, when we are keeping that at that temperature for very long hours 40 to 50 hours during that the graphitization will take place. So, that is basically dissociation of all these combined carbon into iron plus carbon. So, that is Fe 3 C will dissociate into iron plus carbon that is free carbon and this is known as first stage graphitization. So, the first stage graphitization basically is responsible for the conversion of these massive carbides into iron plus graphite or free carbon. Then the second stage graphitization during the annealing process is basically during the slow cooling through allotropic transformation range of iron. Of iron. So, basically when we are cooling slowly through the allotropic transformation range during that process the formation of matrix what kind of matrix will be formed that is governed. So, in that basically all the carbon further is removed and you get the ferritic type of matrix. So, so that type of matrix that is ferritic matrix completely ferritic matrix formation that takes place during the second stage of graphitization during the slow cooling through the allotropic transformation range. So, that is known as second stage graphitization or SSG this is known as first stage graphitization that is FSG. Then you can have the perlitic malleable iron. So, what we have understood that during the annealing cycle of the white cast iron what we see is we go here and then we are cooling it slowly. So, so as we know this is the first stage in, in this case this is the first step. So, this is the first step that is nucleation of graphite taking place then during this range this is known as FSG. So, that is first stage of graphitization and then during the second so in this process in this time all the carbides are basically uh, dissolved and they are giving you iron plus free carbon and then during that this stage your secondary stage graphitization takes place and in that further graphitization during the slow cooling that basically gives you completely ferritic structure. Now, if we want to have the matrix of perlite that is ferrodized perlite or temper martensite and then temper carbon nodules. In those cases you have there are certain treatments and for that basically you have to see that the secondary stage graphitization that has to be prevented. So, 
during the secondary stage graphitization basically your result of SSG is the formation of ferritic structure. Now, that is to be prevented and then if that is prevented if the cooling rate is fast in these cases if you go and if you further heat and then further cool fast in those cases you are getting the paralytic matrix. So, basically if the cooling rate is slow in the slow cooling the ferritic matrix is obtained. However, if that is prevented this SSG is prevented you get the paralytic matrix. So, that gives you more strength. Also you are giving the manganese. So, manganese if it is maintained at 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 percent. So, in that case it retains the perlite. So, complete SSG is prevented also by adding alloying elements like manganese, molybdenum or chromium. So, if these alloying elements are there they try to go for giving you the perlitic matrix. So, one is that you arrest the anneal during the secondary second stage graphitization another is that you are preventing this second stage graphitization where otherwise you could have got the ferritic matrix you are getting the paralytic matrix because of the position the because of the composition which is having manganese molybdenum or chromium and that gives you a paralytic matrix. Then the other variety of cast iron as we have discussed is the ductile iron. So, ductile iron we know that ductile iron is obtained by addition of magnesium or cerium or yttrium in the cast iron melt and that basically uh, converts this flaky graphite into the nodular shape of graphite. So, in this case you have the structure of ferrite and the spheroidal graphite. So, manganese, phosphorus, chromium, nickel, molybdenum should be as low as possible as they retard the process. Now, shorter subcritical annealing cycle may be used when very high impact properties are not desired. So, basically you can go for some heat treatment of ductile iron and this when this high impact properties are not desired you can go for shorter subcritical annealing cycle. So, that gives you the desired properties. Now, the if you discuss about the heat treatment uh, of ductile iron you can go for normalizing of the ductile iron. So, again normalizing means you are going into the range of 900 to 950 degree centigrade and further holding for some time and then you are cooling in the normal air or or atmospheric air. So, that results into homogeneous structure of fine perlite and improvement in tensile properties. So, certainly if you are going for normalizing uh, and you are not cooling very slowly in those cases instead of ferrite you get the fine perlitic uh, matrix. Temperature it at which casting is removed for air cooling affects the hardness. So, the thing is that if you are removing the casting and letting it into air if it is below 850 degree C that will basically affect the hardness. So, you have to maintain a temperature you must not go below certain temperature or below some somewhat like 850 degree centigrade. So, that temperature is one of the parameter at which you have to take it from the furnace and allow it to cool in the air. Heavier sections should contain alloying elements like nickel, molybdenum and additional manganese for satisfactory normalizing. So, that is one of the conditions that you should have these alloying elements. So, that has important role in normalizing because they enhance the hardenability of the material. And normalizing is normally followed by tempering. So, tempering is done. So, tempering will be done to a temperature may be 200 to 400 degree centigrade and holding for some time and then cooling. So, that will be essential once we go for normalizing treatment. Hardening and tempering of ductile iron. So, as we know that if we want to have higher hardness or higher strength we go for hardening. So, for hardening 
it gives so if you do the hardening treatment it gives very high hardness and oil is the preferred medium of quenching although water or brine is also used. Then after quenching casting is normally tempered to induce some softness into the very hard phases which are formed. We also go for surface hardening processes less so flame or induction processes are used which gives the hardness on the surfaces up to certain skin depth the surface becomes very very hard. Perlitic types of ductile iron are preferred because of short heating cycle of these processes. So, in the perlitic cases you, you need to give only short cycle of heat treatment. So, that is preferred. Iron without free ferrite responds instantly to flame or induction hardening and require no holding time at austenitizing temperature for getting fully hardened. So, this point tells that if it is there is no fully ferrite uh, matrix in that case you go to the austenitizing range and without much of the holding you can further cool. So, so that you get sufficient hardness. So, that is why we have uh, seen that these perlitic types are preferred over the ferritic type of ductile iron. Then we also go for stress relieving which is done normally at 500 to 600 degree centigrade. So, on that you retain for some time and then cool slowly. So, that basically stress relieves the material. One of the very important variety of uh, ductile iron is the os tempered ductile iron which is found by a proper type of heat treatment that is os tempering type of heat treatment. So, that product is known as os tempered ductile iron. So, os tempered ductile iron is having the properties as compared to steel or forged steel so many a so because its uh, strength is as compared to that of forged steel although you can see that its melting temperature is small. So, by cost in cost wise calculations it is cheaper, but its strength is as compared to steel. So, it is having very good toughness with very very high strength its mixture I mean structure consists of two phase mixture of acicular vanadic ferrite and austenite. So, as we have seen in the case of ostempering treatment we are heating coming below the nose of the C curve and then we are holding so that we are getting the magnetic structure. So, same thing is followed here also we are cooling fast then but, but we are holding it at a temperature uh, I mean after the point of C curve about 3 to 400 degree centigrade then we are holding it at that temperature. So, holding that gives you a acicular banatic type of ferritic structure and austenite. So, basically that gives a large amount of toughness in the material a very good strength. So, it is occurring in two stages in the first stage it decomposes to banatic ferrite and carbon enriched as austenite and then in the second stage when we are prolonging the austempering action carbon enriched austenite decomposes to ferrite plus carbide which is in the form of needles into the ferritic matrix and then that basically gives a large amount of strength as well as toughness. So, ADI possesses very good quality. Heat treatment of non ferrous metals and alloys. So, we have so far discussed about the heat treatment of ferrous materials in that we discussed about different varieties of steel carbon steel and steel and then we also discussed about the different varieties of cast iron its heat treatment. Then we also need to discuss about the heat treatment of non ferrous metals and alloys. Now, in the case of non ferrous metals and alloys normally non ferrous materials are used in terms of alloys because whenever we talk about the pure non ferrous materials they are only used when we need specific properties like very high conductivity or so. Uh, otherwise mostly uh, they are used in form of alloys. Now, in the cases of non ferrous materials uh, there are uh, heat treatment processes like homogenization. So, what we see since mostly we have the alloy 
and in case of alloys due to non equilibrium cooling there is a kind of problem which occurs in the case of uh, solidification and during the uh, non equilibrium cooling we have the uh, coding type of structure. So, that is because of this uh, range of solidification and because of the non equilibrium cooling this coding or this is the basically variation or gradient in the composition. So, because of that you have coding and dendritic segregation that is normally observed in the case of non ferrous materials or for any material which has which is has basically a solidification range and which uh, goes while solidification if you cool it under the non equilibrium condition then this coring and dendritic segregation is obvious. So, that basically is required to be eliminated. So, that is basically because of the compositional variation and uh, also we know that there are uh, phenomena like constitutional supercooling. So, there are many things. So, that leads to this coring and dendritic segregation. So, for that so normally you have in osmorphous type of alloys you have this coring and dendritic segregation which is normally observed. So, that is removed by this homogenization process. So, in that basically the alloy will be heated at elevated temperature for several hours. So, if you heat then what happens uh, the composition becomes uh, homogenized and the composition becomes thoroughly same and because of the action of diffusion. So, it becomes homogeneous and choice of suitable homogenizing temperature is limiting limited by solidus line as well as retardation of the process. So, we cannot go above a certain temperature because if you have a solidus range you cannot go above this because then mel melting will take place above this we cannot go because melting will take place and if you go below that too much temperature less I mean below this then at lower temperature there may be less rate of diffusion. So, that is why it is written that this suitable temperature has to be taken so that it is high enough so that there is uh, quite good degree of diffusion taking place so that composition is homogenized it is by the diffusion process the composition is homogeneous and also the diffusion rate is somewhat higher and it should not go beyond this line because then there will be melting of one of the phases. So, that should be avoided. Then the treatment is solutionize, quench and age treatment. So, this is basically in the case of uh, such alloys where on cooling one of the phase has limiting solubility in those cases this age treatment is given age which is known as aging. So, this treatment is given to alloys with solute components having decreasing solubility with decrease in temperature. So, in most of these alloys like aluminum copper system, aluminum silver system, aluminum magnesium system, aluminum silicon system, aluminum zinc system, aluminum magnesium copper system, aluminum magnesium silicon system all these systems basically as the temperature comes down the solute component has the decreasing solubility with temperature. So, in most of the cases what you will see that with temp temperature decreasing there will be something like uh, many cases. So, as, as you further go this is so there will be different kinds of phases. So, as we see that once at this temperature if you go the solubility is at this temperature is this much and once we come down then what happens as we come down the solubility goes on decreasing. So, for those cases what happens you basically cool fast so that this much amount is basically retained into the uh, mixture and then that becomes a super saturated solution at this temperature and what happens that they try to come out because the solubility is less. So, that will be coming out as a coherent phase. So, 
strength and hardness of alloys are improved because of the formation of this coherent or semi coherent particle. So, what happens when? So, in the matrix, what happens once you are trying forcibly to retain this, this composition of so this is solute component, once it is retained, in that case, what happens? They try to come out as the temperature increased further. So, slowly what happens you have the formation of precipitates will be coming up slowly. So, because your solubility was quite low here. So, once we increase further the temperature little bit and hold for some time then this coming of this fine precipitates they try to come out. So, this aging treatment so solutionize means you are going to a high temperature then you are quenching. So, quenching will do so fast quenching or fast cooling so that you are taking this much of solute that is arrested in that matrix and then since its solubility is less so it will try to come out of it and then that basically comes in the form of coherent or semi coherent particles so that gives an interface and basically that impedes the dislocation movement. So, that is basically the concept of strengthening in the case of non ferrous metals and alloys. So, that is known as edging. Now, if we are leaving it in the natural atmosphere for long time then that is known as natural edging. Otherwise, if we are edging to certain temperature so, we are heating to certain temperature and holding for some time in that case the sizes of these precipitates they grow. Okay. So, that is known as precipitation hardening and then once we age for larger time or at larger temperature then sometimes they over age. So, that is normally the concept of strengthening because of the precipitation in the case of non ferrous metals and alloys. So, in the case of over aging you have incoherent particles which are formed and there will be incoherency because of that the strength decreases. So, aging basically depends upon the temperature and time function and that is normally the concept of uh, aging in the case of non ferrous metals and alloys. So, that is aging is done in the temperature of 100 to 200 degrees C range. So, this is normally the uh, heat treatment procedure normally in the case of non ferrous metals and alloys. Thank you.